Uh, good evening, um, once again. Today we want to look at we want to look at um, constitutional developments in the Gold Coast, and basically we are looking from the period between 1900 to 1957, and we will specifically look at the 1903 Constitution which was the first constitution uh, promulgated in the, in the country. Let's take a look at our lesson objectives. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to discuss the features of the 1903 constitution. Again, every constitution has its own limitations and strength. So you should also be able to state some of the limitations of the 1903 Constitution. So let's introduce ourselves to uh, this whole I mean, Constitution. So during the colonial era, Southern Ghana was administered um, differently from Asante the Northern Territories and British Togoland or Volta region today. So when we say Southern Ghana, we were referring to the Gold Coast proper. And the Gold Coast proper referred to the Southern state, that is south of Asante, towards the coast. That area or that region was what we refer to as Southern Ghana or the Gold Coast proper. So the Gold Coast, Asante was not part of the Gold Coast. So when you say Gold Coast, Asante, was not part of the Gold Coast. Now, then, of course, the Northern Territories today, we have the Northern regions, and then also the British Togoland, that area is what we have as the Volta region today. So we are saying that the Gold Coast proper, which is Southern Ghana, was administered separately or differently from these other three regions. And the main reason was that Asante was not a colony at that at this period because Asante was considered until 19, up to even 1900, was considered as a conquered state. While the Northern, I mean, um, the Northern Territories and British Togoland were also regarded as protectorate. So the Northern Territories and then the British Togoland were regarded as, as protectorate in the sense that the British were protecting these areas from, from other uh, other foreign power, I mean, other foreign powers or other uh, foreign European powers. And so for this reason, Asante, the Northern Territories and British Togoland were ruled directly by, by the governor, assisted by the chief commissioners and district commissioners. However, Southern Ghana, or the colony proper, actually had an executive and legislative council, you know, that helped the governor in administering the country. So a constitution was then set up for uh, the southern people or the colony proper or the Gold Coast. Whereas in Asante and in whereas in Asante and in in the northern of course territories they were administered I mean differently. So we will look at some of the various uh, constitutions that was set up by for the the, the I mean the colonies. A constitution, as we all know, is a body of uh, fundamental principles and rules which a country is governed. So the fundamental principles and rules by which a country is governed is what we term as a constitution. So we will look at all these constitutions, 1903 constitution, the 1916 constitution, also known as the Clifford constitution, because they were introduced by the people that you see or you find their names there. The Gadgetbeck constitution of 1925, 1946, Alamban's Constitution, 1951, the Kusi Constitution, then 1954, we look at the Nkrumah Constitution. But today, we are only going to focus our attention on the 1903 Constitution, where we, look, we will look at the features of the 1903 Constitution. Let's look at the features. But before we look at the features, this was the map or the colonial map of Ghana at this period. When you look at this map, you see that 1902, of course, the Northern Territories, Ashanti, 1896, the Gold Coast or the Gold Coast Colony, 1874, 
then we have the British mandated Togoland, also 1957. All those areas are all the dates around there are the times or the the, the, the periods in which those areas were all you know became a British um, colony or became part of the British Empire. So that was the colonial map at that time. So the Gold Coast, as you see there, just only referred to that portion of the map, Ashanti, the Northern Territories, and the British mandated to land, as you have seen in the map, were not referred to as the Gold Coast. And so don't be uh, I mean, surprised if, if somebody tells you that the Gold Coast was not part of the the, the, the Ashanti was not part of the Gold Coast. So let's look at the features. Now, the features of the 1903 Constitution. Now, the Constitution provided for both Executive Council and the Legislative Council. So we know what the Executive does and what the Legislative or the Legislature also does. So let's look at the people or the composition of the Executive Council. So the ex Executive Council comprised of four members initially, four members comprised of the Executive Council, and they were the Colonial Secretary, the Financial Secretary, the Attorney General, and the head of the Army. They were heads of the most important department in, in the colony at that time. So you look at the Colonial Secretary, the Financial Secretary or the Treasurer, and the Attorney General, and the head of the Army, or the Army Commander. These four people made up or formed the Executive Council of the first constitution that was promulgated in the country. Then the 1903 constitution uh, came to replace the head of the army with the director of public works. So the head of the army or the army, the head of the army was, was I, mean, I mean, that position was changed and the director of public works now came to replace the head of the army in the 1903 constitution. It was believed that it was improper to involve the army in civilian administration because at this time the British were, 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 were in the course of ruling us and they felt that involving the army, the head of the army or the army in, in a civil administration or civilian administration was not right and so they had to take away the position of the head of the army and, and replace it with a director of public works. Now, the executive council was presided over by the colonial governor. So whenever they go for meetings, they uh, or sitting, the, the colonial governor at that time, who was appointed by the, by the crown, would be the, uh, the chairman, or he will preside over the, the council. Now, all the council members were also European civil servants. So you can imagine, all the executive council members were European civil servants who were appointed by the European themselves. So in the highest council, there wasn't any African or Ghanaian in there. And that should tell you that this is a constitution for the Ghanaians, not for the British. But however, in their highest, the highest council uh, as, as, as stipulated in the constitution had no Ghanaian representative in the or Ghanaian representation and therefore that was a cause for alarm. So let's look at the legislative council and find out if there were uh, Ghanaian representation also there. Now the legislative council also composed of uh, it, it was also chaired by the governor. So the governor chaired both the executive and the Legislative Council. Now the Council was made up of, of both official and unofficial members. So both official and unofficial members made up the Legislative Council. Now the, who were the official members? The official members were a group of senior of course, government officials appointed by the colonial governor and they were in the majority. So even in the Legislative Council where the laws and the policies were being formulated, the Europeans or the official members who were appointed by the, of course, colonial governor, were the majority. And if they are the majority, it therefore means that every policy that they agreed to will, will suit their own interest, but not the interest of the majority, that is the Ghanaian. 
even though the, the Europeans were seen were the minority in this case, but they had appointed more of their senior members or officials on the Legislative Council for them to become majority. Uh, the unofficial members held on official positions of the colonial administration, and most of them were somehow uh, Africans or Ghanaians. So let's look at the, the functions of the Executive Council. We are saying that the Executive Council, or we have already said that the Executive Council was chaired by the uh, colonial governor, and it had no Ghanaian representation. Let's look at that of their function. What were they supposed to do? So like any executive would do, the council met regularly to uh, consider all major uh, government policies and plans. And they, again, uh, again, the council also supervised the proper implementation of government policies and plans. And also the council served as an ad advisory body to the governor, and these were some of the, the functions of the executive uh, I mean, councils. And so they met to consider all the policies that government had put in place, or the plans that government, uh, uh, I mean, has for the people. And also, the council also supervised the proper implementation of government policies. They made sure that all the policies that the government had brought up was well uh, implemented by those who were in charge of that. So let's look at the, the features of the, of the Legislative Council. Now, let's look at the functions of the Legislative Council to as well. So we know what the Executive Council does with no African representation. Let's also look at the function of the Legislative Council. Now, the Legislative Council was the law-making body of, of the country, and it was expected to make laws for the good governance of the country. So Legislative, I mean like Parliament, they make laws for the country. The Legislative Council also considered bills and passed ordinances and laws deemed appropriate for the smooth administration of the colony. So the bills and the ordinances that they felt was good for the country, they passed them, or the laws, they passed them, they signed and passed them. The, the Legislative Council again debated the, the proposed annual budget of the government. So, with, I mean, the government presents its budget to the council, and the Legislative Council then debate on it as it is being done today in the Ghanaian Parliament House. The council also provided a forum for discussing the problems and the grievance of the people. So if the people are aggrieved, uh, I mean, aggrieved by anything or any, they are, they are representatives, you know, speak out and, 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 and discuss these problems with the council. So these were the, the functions of the Legislative Council under the 1903 Constitution, as we would know in any other area. So now we know the composition of the Legislative Council and the Executive Council under the 1903 Constitution. Let's look at some of the limitations of this Constitution. What were some of the weaknesses of this Constitution? What was not good about this Constitution? Now, the limitations of the Executive Council, so let's take them one after the other. From the, some of the limitations of the Executive Council, the weaknesses in the appointment in the Executive Council, then we will look at also the weaknesses in that of the Legislative Council. Now, the Council served as an advisory body to the Governor. The Governor was not obliged to accept the advice of the Council. And so, the, the Colonial Governor had the power to either accept or, of course, not to accept whatever the council tells him or her. In the event of disagreement with or, with or disapproval of the council's advice on issues, the governor was expected to state 
his uh, reasons and notified the Secretary of State in London. Again, the Executive Council was made up of only European civil servants, and this is one of the weakness of the Executive Council at this time. This provoked a storm of protest by the people because the European civil servants could not be relied upon to promote the interests of Ghanaians. So as I earlier on indicated, earlier indicated, you, you, you saw that only European civil servants were appointed in the, in the executive councils and therefore all the policies that they will formulate would be in their interest. The majority who were the Ghanaians will not benefit from any of the policies that will be formulated or plans that will be, of course, implemented by the executive councils. And so this caused great dissatisfaction among the educated elite. And we will see that these educated elite would, from time on, protest. Let's look at the limitations of that of the legislative council. Okay. Now, look at the limitations of the Legislative Council. We are seeing that the decisions of the Council could not also prevail in the sense that it was subject to the governance veto power. So this is a Legislative Council which were supposed to pass laws, ordinances, I mean discuss the grievance of the people and all of that. But we are seeing that their decision could not prevail. Uh, in all cases, there could be a time that the governor, one person, could veto every decision that was agreed upon by the Legislative Council. So in, in, so, so, so in essence, the Legislative Council was not an independent organ of government at this, at this period. It was under the authority of the executive, which is not supposed to be so. Each of the organs are supposed to be independent and they should be allowed uh, to work freely. There should be a separation of powers between them. However, this is a weakness because the Legislative Council was under the power of the Executive Council, and so they were not independent. Again, the nature of composition of the Council was uneven. It was dominated by whites, while Ghanaian formed the minority on the council. So, as usual, all the people that were appointed to the legislative council were all Ghanaians, I'm sorry, were all white or Europeans. So, Ghanaian representation or Ghanaians became minority on the legislative council. And once you become a minority, it means that all the decisions that will be taken, you may, you, you may not have a say because when we vote, definitely you will be outnumbered and so always decisions were taken in the interest of the Europeans but not the interest of the Ghanaians okay and the last one there was a limited application to of the elective principle there was a limited application of the elective principles which excluded Asante Northern Territories the British Togoland uh, from the council. This did not promote effective integration of the country. So there was a limited application of elective I mean, like principles. So the elective principle is the right to elect your people. We are saying that in this constitution, the Asante, the Northern Territories and British uh, Transvolta who were not part of this constitution. It means that this 1903 constitution was only meant for the Gold Coast, excluding Ashanti, the Northern Territories, and the British Togo land. And so as you have seen in your shots over there, that's a picture of the Legislative Council uh, at their various meetings. Of course, today we have enlightened ourselves about the 1903 um, Constitution. We have looked at the functions of uh, we have looked at the features of the 1903 constitution and we realized that it had both executive and legislative council which were all both made, uh, made up of Europeans and more so the Europeans were the majority on the legislative council and therefore all decisions 
that they made were for their interests. And we've also looked at some of the limitations of the both councils, the legislative and the executive council. Join me same time next week or same time, anytime. We shall meet and we will continue with the other um, constitution. But before I go, let me give you this work to try your hands on. You can also, of course, contact me on 054 and subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much.